Hey, friend, and happy new year. Oh, boy, what a year it's going to be. With U.S. presidential elections ahead, global wars raging, AI on the rise, public health, environmental, and economic concerns all heightened, the decisions we make this year will be consequential ones. Courageous and intentional leadership will matter. Authentic messages will matter. And equitable approaches will matter. You are going to need a trusted partner as you navigate through whatever challenges unfold for you in this year ahead. And I promise I will be there with you through it all. In just a few weeks, we will kick off Season 9 of the Mission Forward podcast, and it is expected to be our most incredible yet. With global thought leaders who will provide their take on the issues and practical approaches to help you navigate those issues, I'm going to meet you where you are and help you guide your year ahead as a communicator for change. Now, we'll be back in just a few weeks with all new content. But until then, I hope you enjoy some of our most listened to shows from last season. And I hope you'll drop me a line if there's something you hope to hear on the show in the new year. You can get me over at carrie at mission.partners. Until then, I hope you enjoy today's show, and I look forward to being back with you soon. Hi there, and welcome to the Mission Forward podcast, where each week we bring you a thought-provoking and perspective-shifting conversation on the power of communication. I'm Carrie Fox, your host and CEO of Mission Partners, a social impact communications firm and certified B Corporation. And if you are new to listening, well, I'm glad you're here. At Mission Forward, we take on topics relevant to public communications and purpose-driven professionals. We explore what's behind the most effective communicators and the most equitable communications, all in an effort to help you along your journey as a communicator for change. If you like what you hear, I hope you will give this show a five-star rating and share this episode or any of our other great shows with the people in your network. And I promise today's show is definitely going to be one to share. Today's guest is Jennifer Brandel, serial entrepreneur and innovator who works between industries to address how to better design systems that listen, respond, and evolve with their stakeholders. She is co-founder of Harkin, Zebras Unite, Civic Exchange Chicago, Election SOS, Democracy OS, and WBEZ Chicago's Curious City. Oh my gosh, I'm tired thinking about that. In full transparency, I had the opportunity to work closely with Jennifer over the last many months, which gave me an even better understanding of her work and her approach. But before all that, I remember the first time I was connected with her. It was back in 2020 when a foundation reached out to see if my team could support with some promotion rated related to Election SOS. That was the first time I came across Jen's work, and I remember thinking, I want to be in this woman's orbit. She is super smart, creative, knows how to make messy problems solvable, and has the best glasses around. Today, we are going to talk about chance encounters, the power of listening, and why curiosity can save us all. Jennifer Brandel, welcome to Mission Forward. Thank you so much for having me. What a delight. Oh my gosh, I've been looking forward to this for a while. And I'm curious if you will start by just telling us a little bit about what brought you to this amazing body of work that you now um, run over at Harkin and all of the other incredible initiatives that you oversee. Whew. Okay. Um, where to begin? There's so many different starting points, but maybe the easiest one will be kind of what brought me into media overall, because that was not a foregone conclusion. I was studying art history and philosophy and integrated liberal studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I had a real hard time picking a major, which in our conversation will probably be no surprise as I have a real hard time picking an, in- an industry or a sector or a, you know, like categorizing the world in what I feel like are false boxes. And so long story short, um, I was headed to a philosophy class my senior year. It was a beautiful spring day. And a friend of mine named Michi uh, intercepted me as I was walking up to my the building where the class was in. And he was like, what are you doing now? I was like, I'm going to class. He's like, you got to skip. Where there's this amazing guy who's going to be speaking at the student union tonight. His name is Ira Glass. And I was like, who? What? And he said, public media. I was like, 
I don't listen to radio. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but there was something about it. And I'm not like the class skipping type of person. I remember thinking how much every class cost when I did the analysis, mm. how expensive college was. And I'm like, this is $500 I'm throwing away. But anyway, I think it must have been like the warm spring air and the, you know, the glint of the sun on the buildings. I'm like, let's do it. I can, I'm going to go. And so I went and that was my introduction to public media, public radio, Ira Glass and the power of, of media, essentially of reporting. I remember being in this big hall and for a moment he turned the lights off and told everyone, you know, how is the voice in just hearing my voice and what I'm saying different from seeing me and having all these other dimensions represented. And I just was blown away by everything he was saying, by the content he was playing from This American Life. And I had a notebook and I was almost at the end of my notebook because it was at like the end of the semester. And I ended up running out of room taking notes from what he was saying and was writing it in pen on my arms because I just didn't <laughs> want to forget. <laughs> it was so like speaking to me that literally I was trying to inject it in my veins. <laughs> and like the next day I started volunteering at WORT, the community radio station in Madison, oh uh, because I was just so moved by what radio could do, what media could do, the power of the creative storytelling. And lo and behold, I wrote a really bananas cover letter for an internship to NPR on like vellum paper with, um, I hand calligraphied it like I was an art student before I, and it, anyway, long story. <laughs> I wrote a really bananas, um, uh, like, internship letter and they called me up and they're like, do you want to intern at the arts desk? <laughs> and I was like, no, thanks. I have already planned to go to Italy for a while to caretake on someone's vineyard for a bit. And then I came to my senses and called them back like two hours later. And I was like, wait, 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 can, can I do this? I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I, I had no idea anything. So I found myself in NPR like six months after hearing wow. a class surrounded by all these amazing people who I had no idea who they were, which was kind of great because I had no fear around them. I was like telling other interns, I'm like, I'm going to lunch with this guy, Corey Flintoff and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh my God, you're asking them to lunch? I was like, yeah, what's the big deal? He's, he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> so, it was kind of great that I had this beginner's mind because I was, I was just like thrown into this. Now what I understand is an incredible and important legacy in media um, just through the power of skipping class one day. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, I, I love that story on so many levels, but it is so purely Jennifer Brandel because <laughs> you have this optimistic spirit about even the most complicated issues, right? We have worked together on some issues related to um, local news and the news sector, but not just that. I mean, really broadly, everything you touch is touching, touching issues of democracy. And those are some of the most complicated conversations to be having today. And yet you bring an optimistic spirit to that work. How do you do that? How do you <laughs> always see the optimism in the big challenge? Well, beyond Zoloft, um... <laughs> Which, you know, truth be told, I am on. But I've always been this way. I think Zoloft just really helped me through the pandemic and some serious hormonal changes. But um, no shame in that game. So many people I love are on Zoloft. Um, but honestly, I think it's around um, the fact that like holding life seriously but lightly, like mm. understanding, at, at least my understanding of it, I have no idea what happens after we die, you know, what the point of this all is. But if I think of it as an opportunity to always be learning, connecting with one another, increasing our compassion, uh, being courageous, and supporting what we know, like in our bodies to be aligned with what is good for people, then I'm, I'm game. I'm into it. And so I'm always looking for folks and, and people who are not just focused on reactive things or, um, you know, trying to mitigate problems. That's great. I'm just not inspired by that space. I want to be on the proactive side of trying things mm -hmm. out because if obviously if we had a solution to these things, we, they wouldn't be problems. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, to me, I'm, I'm just excited about working on that, that edge of what are the things we haven't thought of or tried or what has not worked in the past, but it might be the right time to try now because the context has shifted. Where can we get wisdom from many different areas, times, geographies, altitudes, et cetera, that could help us right now? So I'm kind of voracious right. in, in bringing together um, lessons from all sorts of things, mysticism, scientists, right. you know, conversations with my neighbors, like they all connect to the work. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can find a connection in anything. And I think that's the beautiful thing about your work. For those who don't know you, and I suspect there's quite a few listening who do, but for those who don't, tell us a little bit about Harkin. 
Yes. Oh my goodness. Well, hearken means the word itself, if you've heard it, means to listen. And it's all over a lot of religious um, texts. If you grew up reading the Bible or anything else, it's hearken to the angels, hearken to this. Um, but it also, also means to pay respectful attention. The other thing about the word itself, and this is getting super nerdy, and if I had my way, this is all I would talk about. It's just like <laughs> wordplay and whatnot. But if um, there's two different ways to spell the word, there's H-A-R-K-E-N and H-E-A-R-K-E-N. And we chose the more archaic version, H-E-A-R-K-E-N, because it contains two words that kind of explain everything. There's hear and there's ken. You know, hear means obviously like not just to listen, but to like take in information. And ken means to expand your range of knowledge. And ken, you know, you might have heard uh, sayings like, it's out of my ken. It's not something you probably hear every day, mm -hmm. but hearken. Um, the other thing I love about it is that the H-E-R sounds like heart, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really about how do we help people listen to expand their range of knowledge and to make connections in this world. And so Mission Partners has helped us in a lot of ways really reposition and think about what it is we do because we've kind of become synonymous in the journalism sector with like a technology that helps listen and respond to the people that newsrooms are trying to serve um, or, you know, a framework of this public powered process. But we're really we're really adaptable to any problem set in which stakeholders and the people their decisions affect are too far away from each other and we're trying to bring them closer and have these moments in which they can connect so mm -hmm. at the end of the day we're a social impact consultancy that uses this power of engagement to impact and influence systems for public good and that could be sectors or you know particular newsrooms or or whatnot like we've worked with Sundance and the Carter Center and, you know, the BBC and local tiny media companies, like up and down the chain, we, we see this, these same problem sets um, evident. What really struck me the first time I met you and has continued to, to sit with me is that you developed Harkin before COVID, before the largest racial unrest that our, um, our country has seen in recent history you were thinking about the spaces that existed within systems, the spaces that existed between those who sit in powerful positions and those who are members of a community. And you realized that there was something that needed to happen to close those spaces for democracy to really work at its best, right? And I think when you think about democracy, you're not just thinking about government entities, you're thinking about democratic pra practices, participatory practices, civic engagement, right? Yep. Collectively. And then we think about what's happened over the last few years and how relevant your work has become, even more relevant than it was in 2015, how necessary your work is. So I'd love for you to share an example of how your work is playing out in systems and institutions in this idea of, you mentioned it at the top, that this is not just addressing an issue in a sector. You're really thinking holistically about how, how sectors across the board can consider their role in advancing more democratic ideals and practices? Whew, okay, where to begin? <laughs> this is a great juicy question. Um, maybe I'll start with a, a brief story about kind of my personal experience with feeling the pain of this distance between people mm -hmm. who are in power and people who their decisions impact. So as I mentioned, I didn't necessarily study journalism. And even when I was in NPR, like I wasn't doing journalism. I was, you know, helping research. I was getting the mail. I was, you know, producing little things here and there, but I wasn't getting journalism training. And I started pitching WBEZ, the public radio station in Chicago, where I was living after my twenties. And I ran around the world was like a great picker in Tasmania and psychometric test developer in Montreal. I wrote like, <laughs> this is something I don't know that I mentioned to you, but I would write, um, I was a, a pen writer for an exotic dancer, um, writing a sex ed column in a paper. Anyway, it was a wild 20s. But <laughs> the most interesting woman alive, Jennifer Brandel, everyone. <laughs> no, but I, I ended up, um, you know, in Chicago in my 20s doing all sorts of random things, trying to make ends meet and make rent. And I was listening to the public radio station and I was like, I should start pitching them story ideas because I'm seeing all these cool things happening. Long story short, I kind of taught myself how to do public radio through pitching the station, working with them and, and, you know, just by doing, which is how I like to learn. And one day I went from, you know, pitching them stories to them pitching me stories to then suddenly being in the newsroom at the editorial table where decisions get made. And I remember 
it's like the day before that I had no power to determine what narratives, information, frameworks, metaphors, et cetera, that my community got. And then the next day I felt like I had way too much power. It was too much responsibility. And I didn't understand how, you know, no matter how smart, diverse, thoughtful, et cetera, the people in the room were making decisions on behalf of all of Chicago, which is millions and millions of people. I was like, how can we be sure that we are helping them get their information needs met? Mm -hmm. We have a lot in common. We do not know what it is like to be a new migrant to this country or the city. We do not know what it is like to live on minimum wage. Do, we do not know, you know, fill in the blanks. And it felt impossible and like we were set up to fail to be in this position to assume that we knew best. And so another chapter of my life in my 20s was working for the Baha'i faith. Um, they are an independent world religion started in the 1800s out of Iran. Um, their prophet is this man named Baha'u'llah. And um, I was working for them, helping to translate their faith to non-jargony um, language so that more people could understand what the faith did. And they had this absolutely transformative approach to community building, which was this humble posture of learning. And instead of like many religions or even NGOs or whatnot do, instead of going into a community and saying, hey, we see a problem that we know how to solve. Let us teach you how to do it. And then we'll make sure you can do it. And then we'll leave and, you know. Hooray, hooray. They didn't assume that they knew what was best for people. They assumed that the people closest to their problems knew what was best for them and they were just there to help. And so they had this approach, which is we have two hands, how can we help you versus we know how to solve your problems. And I thought that was so mind blowing. And when I looked at every industry, journalism included, we were taking the opposite approach. Mm -hmm. We know what's best for you. We know what information you need to make decisions. We know what's important to you. And, and you can't. It's just, frankly, a lie. And so um, I, I just kept thinking about how do we close these gaps in the systems um, between these decision makers? And in part, it's really a problem of how do you take a system that's closed and make it open? How do you take a system that's top down or hierarchical and allow some, some channels for bottom up grassroots feedback to come in? And then how do you make that part of your workflow so that it's not a nice to have thing you do every so often, but it's actually core to your principles so that you are essentially user testing or market testing everything you make, whatever products it is, whether it's content or actual tangible goods. Um, you're always in sync with the people that you're serving because they get a chance to weigh in. And it's not just with a focus group once a year that produces an 80 page white paper that no one reads. It's actually a commitment to continuous learning and evolution. Right. Right. So where do you then come in to the work? Are you coming in at the highest levels with the people who are in those positions of power who say, OK, we get it. We realize there's a better way of doing this work. Help us figure it out. Or do you come in at a maybe a lower level where someone's saying this system is not working for us? You've got to help us think about how to manage the, the upward elements of the system. Tell, tell us how that works. That's a great question. I mean, really, there is no title and correlation between people who see the problems <laughs> um, and, and people with the ability to change them. So we hear from interns and low level, you know, early career people in an, in an organization who say, I see a problem and I know our system is totally screwed. And we hear from CEOs and the people in power who say, oh my gosh, this thing isn't working and it's clear and we need to figure out a new way to do things. So it, it really is that insight of a system not being healthy and not having the right flow and um, call and response with the people you're serving is something anyone can really recognize. And we get those emails from every, every part of the chain. But at the end of the day, to do this work, it's culture change work. It's change management work. It's technology work. It's incentives work. And that can really only be funded and supported by the people at the top because the lower level employees don't have the budget the clout or the decision-making power to, to, to do this kind of work, although they can do experiments that we can help them with on very low levels to prove out the theory. But they um, unfortunately just aren't in a position to, to make that change themselves. I remember asking this question to Tina Rosenberg, who was on the podcast a while back, and I am a huge, huge fan of her work and Same. solutions journalism in general. And I remember asking her, if she could name a system that she believes is working just the way it should be, right? <laughs> She's like, it's an impossible question. Um, but do you, right? Like, are we driven by the ideal of a system or do we know that there is, in fact, a model that works? Wow. Um, 
I look to nature when you say that question. The immediate thing that came to mind was that the intelligence that exists in our world holistically knows what's up. It adapts. It generates. And obviously, it's not like working as it should because climate collapse, et cetera. But these individual um, systems are incredibly adaptable. They are able to um, to usually, over time, if they're given enough time, adapt to changing conditions and, and make sure that life can be sustained. And so I think there's probably beautiful ecosystems that have some balance in it in the world, and those are working well. But they're increasingly endangered because we keep encroaching upon them, right, obviously, right. and like putting our footprint on them. But I, I think what immediately comes to me is like nature, bodies, there are things that are working. And the more that we can learn organizationally um, from nature and we can start recognizing patterns of things that work that have been here for millennia before we have been here to screw it up, I think the better we are equipped to to make things happen. And not to sound too woo-woo, but actually I really don't care because I am woo-woo. Um, <laughs> but I always want to say to the people who aren't woo-woo, don't worry, I can also like speak your language of KPIs and whatnot, um, is that the, every time we design a system that is in harmony with how the natural world works, it is it is workable and it is working. <laughs> and there are so many things that are out of balance right now because they are kind of breaking fundamental laws of, of nature and, and of humanity and how people work. And they're not being designed for our best and, and, and highest good. Do you see that the trajectory that our that our human race <laughs> is where, where we are as a society, as a world, as a human race? Is there any hope that in the near term we will find or or maybe refine some of the balance that we have lost? I, I do believe so. But the thing I believe is that it's going to happen in small groups. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen in community and through mutual aid. And it might be happening in an apartment building in which there's an ecosystem that someone's sick and the neighbor brings the soup and gets the mail and helps out. And, you know, that we are responsible to one another. And I was I was actually on um, on an incredible, incredible mind expanding uh, meeting with this woman, Nora Bateson, a couple weeks ago. And she talks about this whole idea of warm data. And what are the things that we cannot capture, you know, easily in words and, and dashboards and all of that stuff. And I'm going to just bring, I want to mm -hmm. make sure I have it right. I'm just going to bring out the, the sentence she said that I wanted to get tattooed on me. I don't have tattoos, but <laughs> if I did, I might put this one in. When we think about any of these, any of these systems that we're involved in, if they are on some level asserting that or pretending that people don't need each other, they are harmful. And if they are dividing people who might otherwise be able to help each other, they are harmful. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at like if you look at it in, in that way, like they're basically not aligned with the truth, which is that we do need each other and people need to help each other. <laughs> like you, right. know, you shouldn't be dividing people. And when you look for signs of that, we just slice and dice so many things and divide them even unconsciously, whether it's by oh, this industry, or this is your job and your swim lane and, yeah. and not what you're supposed to do. And I think that flattening um, really denies people their humanity, their dignity, and ultimately can lead to violence when we flatten things and divide them in different ways. I know I'm getting like pretty esoteric here, but I hope, I hope that's like, this is what I'm thinking about. You're sparking a story for me. Do you know uh, the name Leland Melvin, astronaut? No. no. One of the first black astronauts, if I recall, I don't think he is the first, but um, he has this great story about the first time he went to space and he was in the space shuttle and he had gone to space with um, if, uh, astronauts from a few different countries. So he was um, in, on this space mission with someone from Russia and there were a few other countries that were represented. And he remembers the first time that he looked down and said, oh my gosh, that's that's Earth, how incredible that is. And oh my gosh, I can see the United States, how incredible that is. And then the astronaut next to him said, oh my gosh, and I see my home country. I see Russia, how incredible this is. And they looked at one another and they said, if only mm. our leaders could be here right now, if only they could remember that we are, we are all connected, right? We are all of the same human race and how easy it is to forget that how stuck we are on what divides us versus what makes us all connected. That is absolutely it. That is absolutely it. And in fact, like the Baha'i faith comes to mind again because their entire tenet is that the unity of mankind is the mm -hmm. truth. 
like the borders that we create, the ethnicities, the markers, the different things that divide us are actually false. And right. so the more that we recognize that we are one organism, not only human beings, you know, one species, but we are with earth, an entire organism itself, mm -hmm. each of us playing a different part, like cells in the body playing a different part, the more we can be prepared to make decisions, understanding that we affect the system and the system affects us. You know, I can imagine people listening right now, it says, you know, it's all fine and good, but what are we going to do about how <laughs> deeply divided we are, right? That in sometimes, even within a given family, there are deep divides. <laughs> and I'm going to once again, um, call on you as the model that you create and a really incredible uh, interview that you did not too long ago um, with your brother and your father. Can you talk just a bit about that? Oh my goodness, yes. So I'm constantly being humbled by the things that I teach and espouse to others. I'm always practicing at getting better at myself and am no expert in, you know, I, I fail. And so one of those things is um, talking politics and listening and maintaining a level of sincere curiosity with my father. <laughs> and so um, Amanda Ripley is an incredible author. If you haven't looked at her work, she's got this book that came out a couple years ago called High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How to Get Out. And there's another incredible author, Monica Guzman, who has a book called um, I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. I think I got this right. Well done. Okay. And they are both brilliant, brilliant thinkers, journalists, writers, and offer so many tactical and practical ways of starting to um, unwind some of these patterns that have been reinforced by media and by you know other forces to divide us. And so I got a, an email from my dad one day, one of many that was just made my blood boil. You know, one of those political chain emails that's like, you know, I can't talk about Muslim now with people not getting mad at me. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't do this. And I realized that I had kind of given up on my dad as someone I could talk to and listen to. And that was not a good thing. If I'm going to try and help bring people together through curiosity, through listening, through responding to their needs, through being, treating them with dignity, I'm, I'm not doing it close to home. And it's often hardest to do the things that you can do professionally. Mm -hmm close to home. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wrote into Amanda Ripley. She's got this great podcast on Slate called How To. And I asked <laughs> how to have political conversations with your family without yelling, because my brother and I had just gotten to a really ugly feedback loop with my dad in which he would start writing. My brother would start writing back. He's a lawyer. So he would write back with all of these like facts and points. And I'm like, that's not going to work. And then we would have these text chains that would blow up. And Monica and Amanda, um, through a two-part series on this podcast, helped me and my, my family start to unwind some of these things and practice some of the approaches in their books. And I will say it, it really works and it really helps. And I keep, it is a practice. Like we've slid, backslid as a family mm -hmm. into these text chains a little bit. And I'm like, can we just remind ourselves that this is not the environment in which we can have these conversations. We need to make the time. We can't just do it over text. It's too low fi et cetera. Right. Um, and so it's really that curiosity and listening that I think, like you said, can save the world. <laughs> um, but it's a practice. It's not something all of us do naturally. Well, we're coming to the end already, which is hard to imagine. Whoa. But <laughs> if I think about just reflecting on everything you've shared today, I said earlier on, somewhat jokingly, the most interesting woman alive. But my goodness, I mean, on so many levels, Jen, what I have learned from you as a caring leader, as a courageous leader, as a creative leader, how you truly do center curiosity because you are curious and you use that curiosity to help then improve the world around you. Last couple minutes, mm -hmm. um, I would reinforce to those listening who don't know Jennifer Brandell and her work to go check it out and to support it in any way you can. Um, but tell us what's got you uh, feeling good, feeling hopeful, feel excited about the work that you're doing these days. Uh, that's a great question. Um, Harkin, the company I've run, you know, and the initiatives we've spun out that you've named at the beginning, many of around democracy, I feel like we're coming to a moment in which many more people are recognizing that collaborations and the interdependencies of sectors, of organizations, of even, you know, departments within a company need to be in better and closer communication with one another. And the more we divide and silo ourselves and separate the work, it's at our peril. We're missing insights. We're missing opportunities to leverage one another's work. We're being less efficient. All of these things translate into the workplace of, of basically making our lives harder. And also 
making us just keep doing things the same way over and over again, rather than evolving at the speed at which we could be. And so I'm really excited um, with our Democracy SOS work, we're going to be doing a lot of work pairing civic organizations. Um, so that could be the League of Women Voters or the Better Government Association or, you know, Braver Angels or these different groups that are um, working to help on this polarization and information problem to work with newsrooms and to actually you know, leverage their each of their strengths to to bring about better communication for the electorate in time for the 2024 elections. So it's a big, <laughs> big challenge, an exciting one. But um, yeah, anyone listening, if you have work <laughs> that you feel like mm -hmm. journalists could or should be using it, that's research, information, tactics, etc. Or you're in a newsroom and you want to find people to help you because you have fewer staff than you used to and you need research or information on voter guides or whatever, like reach out. We're here to help matchmake and help facilitate those collaborations so that we aren't just all in our own corner doing the same thing, but we're actually doing it together. Amazing. Amazing. And you, you said it so well several times throughout the power of closing those gaps when we see them and what they can do for society as a whole. So Thank you, Jennifer Brandel, for all of your, your work and for the work of your colleagues. It is so inspiring and I'm so glad to have this conversation today. A delight. Thank you so much, Carrie. And I'm really honored to be on your podcast. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Mission Forward. Thanks for tuning in today. If you are stewing on what we discussed here today, or if you heard something that's going to stick with you, drop me a line at carry at mission.partners and let me know what's got you thinking. And if you have thoughts for where we should go in future shows, I would love to hear that too. Mission Forward is produced with the support of Sadie Lockhart in association with the True Story team. Engineering by Pete Wright. If your podcast app allows for ratings and reviews, I hope you will consider doing just that for this show. But the best thing you can do to support Mission Forward is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.